thank you, Laurie and uh, Bent, for having me here. And uh, I, I think you'll see why they chose me to be the last speaker, because I'm the least likely person here to become a scientist. Uh, when Professor Yagi was admiring crystal structures at age 10, I was increasing security at San Francisco airport uh, by racing airplanes on my bicycle. Uh, and the police would come and I could get away through a ditch uh, after a couple of weeks and I could beat the airplanes for the first 100 yards or so. Uh, I came back and they were building a fence. So uh, it was the start of airport security. Uh, and uh, because uh, I have a condition called aphantasia where unlike most of you that probably have photographic memories, I don't see any pictures at all. So I think conceptually, uh, not in terms of pictures. So for lots of reasons, I barely graduated from high school. Uh, at age 17, I moved to Southern California to take up a, a surfing career. But this was in 1964. Um, uh, most of you don't remember that time, but but we had a, a war going on in Vietnam, uh, and I got literally drafted off my uh, surfboard in 1965. Uh, uh, I ended up in the uh, Navy Medical Corps uh, and uh, ended up as a uh, medic in Vietnam, uh, where I was like a sponge absorbing uh, medicine, medicine treatments, in the military, you can do whatever you're trained to do and they trust you to do. So uh, as a 19-year-old, I was teaching interns and residents how to do spinal taps and liver biopsies. Uh, I turned 21 in Vietnam. I was doing major surgery. Uh, and I was a, a doctor for a village and an orphanage uh, for a year. And it was very satisfying work. I'm one of the few people probably that came out of Vietnam uh, uh, better off uh, than he went in. Uh, I wanted to go into medicine to practice third world medicine, but I had to start school over from scratch. So I started at a community college in San Francisco and then transferred uh, to UC San Diego. And something happened once I got there. I was introduced to high-end scientists for the first time in my career. And uh, I think because of my unusual background, uh, uh, some of these scientists took a liking to me. I was given a, my own research lab as a junior uh, with uh, the uh, late uh, famous biochemist, Nate Kaplan, uh, who trained uh, with Fritz Lippmann and I spent time with Lippmann as well, just for the lineage. Lippmann trained in Germany with Meyerhoff, and you've learned about the Meyerhoff uh, pathways. So I have a very good uh, lineage. Lippmann wrote a book called The Wanderings of a Biochemist that had a lot of influence on me of the strange route he followed uh, through science. Uh, I made a what was considered a major finding at the time uh, and published my first paper as an undergraduate. And uh, I proved that adrenaline worked on the outside of cells, not inside. Uh, and all of a sudden, I just fell in love with doing science, uh, changed my plans from going into medicine, uh, uh, went into science. Uh, I hold the record for the shortest PhD for the University of California system. Uh, didn't do a postdoc and, and went on uh, to do research, um, ending up uh, at the NIH intramural program, uh, where I started exploring life from a different point of view uh, through the lens of what became uh, genomics. Uh, I had sequenced, I had the first automated DNA sequencer developed by uh, Lee Hood's lab and company. Uh, and I sequenced one gene, and I thought this was the most tedious 
silly approach uh, to the world. Uh, so instead of searching for the one out of a million clones, I developed a simple procedure of just randomly selecting clones off a plate and sequencing them. And it became very upsetting to the world because we we're discovering thousands of new human genes every day. Um, professors at Harvard in a place we call the NIH director trying to shut down my lab because it was unfair that I was making these discoveries so quickly. And I was messing up their PhD uh, students' theses uh, by finding the proteins that they were uh, uh, going after. Uh, the latest count, there's up to 74, 2 million ESTs now in the public databases. This was the entire means that the human genome was annotated with genes uh, and still is today with all the splice forms. We had to develop new algorithms to deal with this large number of sequences. And my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Ham Smith, who was pictured uh, in one of the photos uh, the day of his retirement, uh, decided we could apply this mathematical algorithm to sequencing a genome. So we uh, sequenced his pet genome, Haemophilus influenzae, which is what he isolated the first restriction enzymes from that led to his uh, Nobel Prize in 1978. This ended up being the uh, first genome sequence in history. That wasn't our goal. Our goal was just to test the idea, and it ended up uh, working really well. But the problem was trying to define life at the genome level is that over 40% of the genes that we discovered were of unknown function. And so one of the notions we had was by sequencing lots of other genomes, we could maybe find these by comparative genomics. So uh, over the next several years, we sequenced a large number of species, uh, uh, dozens and dozens of pathogenic uh, uh, bacteria. The first archaea uh, went on to do uh, uh, Drosophila and eventually uh, human. And then we uh, did 65,000 miles sailing around the ocean, uh, filtering seawater and shotgun sequencing, everything in the ocean, and we discovered uh, literally tens of millions of new species. Uh, early Norby uh, wrote the uh, forward uh, to this book. This is the US version. Uh, the uh, British version is called Microlands, uh, but it's the same story, uh, and you can get that. But again, most of these genes didn't look like anything anybody had seen before. We found huge families that were highly conserved, uh, but it was very unsatisfying. So we decided maybe the only way to uh, understand the genome was to take the Feynman approach and build it ourselves. This project took uh, over 10 years trying to design life uh, for the first time. And we had a contest uh, at the Institute uh, uh, for people to put their designs together. We made three different designs. Not one of them led to life. Uh, and it's because we do not know enough biology to design things on first principles. Uh, it took us a very long time adding genes back uh, randomly until we could get uh, life and then minimize that. And you can see in the numbers here, out of the this smallest genome of any species, this created a whole new life form that didn't exist, about 149 of those genes, essential for life, uh, are of unknown function. Nothing is known about the biology. Now, when we look at the human genome, uh, it's even a much larger number, larger percentage. Uh, and uh, so despite discovering tens of millions of new species, having more sequences than probably anybody ever uh, thought was even possible, it wasn't increasing our knowledge substantially, just looking at sequence. Uh, when the first discussions about the human genome, 
project took place in the mid 80s. I got immediately excited about it because I had spent 10 years trying to get one protein. So the notion of getting them all in 15 years was very exciting. Uh, and then we realized the approach that we developed for the first genome uh, could speed this up. Um, a company called Applied Biosystems called me up and offered me $300 million to sequence the genome with their new machine. I thought they were joking, but eventually uh, we settled on it. Uh, and we sequenced the genome in nine months using the shotgun sequencing uh, approach. And the challenge has been to then understand how this code codes uh, for each of us. Uh, that was a haploid genome. Uh, a few years later, uh, uh, Sam Levy led the team at the Institute to do a complete diploid genome. It was actually uh, my genome, and, and it became uh, a well-studied. Um, but the key thing about the diploid genome is 75% uh, of the variation in the genome is not contained in SNPs. Uh, everything that's done in genetics today is looking at the 25% of single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, because we have not been able to do diploid genomes. To get diploid genomes here, we had to uh, sequence multiple uh, haploid sperm cells uh, to get phasing of the genome. Uh, now with PacBio and uh, nanopore long-range sequencing, we can assemble uh, complete uh, diploid genomes. Having lots of genomes, we could ask unique questions about the structure and some of the interesting things we found. Every place you see these dips down, uh, this is looking over a billion data points in the genome, are places where the genome cannot tolerate any mutations. So those places where it goes down uh, to zero, uh, if you have a mutation there, those would be things that would cause a spontaneous abortion, for example. They're just incompatible uh, with life. But you see lots of variation. We pooled all the known transmembrane domains together. And you can see uh, there's a, quite a dramatic difference along these transmembrane molecules. Uh, the portion uh, that sits in the lipid membrane uh, can't be messed with. If you get a mutation that puts a charged amino acid in there, uh, it would be a loss of function mutation because the protein would have been sped out of the membrane. Uh, other places you can see it, it doesn't matter very much. Now, the other finding that we made early on was that uh, mice are not little humans, uh, and human cells and culture are not good representation of humans. So this is looking at essential genes uh, that could be characterized, and that when you looked at the essential genes uh, uh, set in humans, that's where you see primary uh, pathogenic disease. So there's lots of genes that are non-essential, and then we have the whole set that we have no idea what they do, uh, but we start to see pathogenic genes. Now, my genome had gotten well characterized by a lot of people, and there are a lot of reports on how I was a heterozygote for ApoE4, and then according to the literature, had a greatly increased chance of having Alzheimer's disease. So I asked my friends uh, uh, in, in neurology, uh, in radiology, uh, would they do a um, PET uh, amyloid MRI and a MRI brain scan? And they said, we can't do that because you don't have any symptoms. And this is a theme we'll keep uh, coming back to. Uh, they finally agreed to do it under a pseudonym because they were worried the genetics actually would actually predict things, and if they found that I had early developing Alzheimer's, that it would ruin my career. Uh, so I, 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 
they came up with a pseudo name. I suggested Charles Darwin. They said, that's too obvious. We don't like that. Um, and so uh, they agreed and uh, did a brain scan. And uh, uh, I, I got a, we we're on vacation uh, the following week. And they called to report the results. Uh, they were very surprised. They said, you have a, a brain of a 40-year-old. And the amyloid was totally zero. Uh, my wife, Heather, said, no, you're wrong. He has a brain of an 18-year-old. Um, uh, but that's, that's a different situation. But uh, it became clear there was a dissociation of what the genetics community was reporting and what we found by actually doing a real phenotype assay. So it became very clear to me instantly that we weren't going to understand the human genome by just sequencing thousands and thousands of human genomes. That we had to have comprehensive phenotype information on each individual together with their complete uh, diploid genome. And we had to have this thousands and thousands of times. So we set up a system uh, with the goal of doing non-invasive uh, phenotype, other than for a, a needle for a blood draw, uh, something that could be done in less than eight hours, uh, and set up a, a paradigm to do this with uh, only uh, starting to look at uh, people that were self-proclaimed healthy. And so you can see we're just trying to understand the genome, trying to set up genotype, phenotype correlations. Uh, and the world started to change very dramatically uh, with just trying to do the simple basic science uh, approach. One of the key things is we were using a new tool in MRI imaging called restriction spectrum imaging. Uh, and this is a game changer, even though it's been around for 15 years, it hasn't reached standard practice yet, uh, because medicine is very slow to change. With restriction spectrum imaging, it looks at water molecules. And it turns out solid tumor cells, like prostate cancer cells, have larger nuclei. They have more water molecules, but the water is less mobile. So the tumors, because of the signal, uh, light up uh, like light bulbs. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but the bright orange areas are where uh, the uh, restriction spectrum imaging uh, indicates that there's a tumor in the prostate and the ultimate path pathology uh, agreed uh, totally uh, with that. Uh, the very first individual to come in to this phenotyping clinic uh, was a physician uh, and his wife. Uh, they were going to go on a long vacation uh, the next day, and he just thought it would be good to have a physical. And you can see this bright light uh, that was a, a tumor found right under his breastbone. Um, and uh, uh, we ruined his vacation plans, uh, but he credits us with saving his life. So starting with individual one of a healthy individual, it wasn't so healthy. Uh, I was testing uh, the MRI machine after being told by one of the top urologists in the world after biopsies and MRI testing that I did not have prostate cancer. Uh, but my own uh, radiologist, after testing the machine, uh, came and told me that I had two very high-grade uh, prostate tumors uh, and that, uh, uh, that they were biopsied and confirmed and I had surgery right away. And it's known yeah, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to analyze my genome, doing the genotype phenotype analysis of why I would have uh, such high-grade uh, prostate cancers. So 
the adrenaline, uh, the, the uh, androgen receptor, testosterone receptor, is linked to prostate cancer because the prostate cannot grow uh, without testosterone. And so there's lots of uh, things that uh, have that associated with cancer, um, but, uh, uh, and one of the major treatments is uh, basically removing uh, testosterone from the body. Uh, the prostate can't grow and cancer is generally stopped. Uh, looking at the androgen receptor, it's a triplet repeat uh, disease gene. It's on the X chromosome, so men get one copy uh, and women get two. And there's a series of CAG repeats in exon one. And it turns out there's a range of seven to 36, that's sort of a normal range. Uh, the higher number of repeats, the less expression of the androgen receptor there is. Uh, individuals with very high numbers of repeats, uh, uh, 40 to 62 have, uh, there's two different diseases, Klinefelter syndrome shows up and Kennedy's disease uh, with this big expansion. There's also an unusual phenomenon, the higher number of repeats you have, the higher the odds of you being left-handed. Uh, so uh, lots of things can be attributed to the X chromosome and to the testosterone receptor. The opposite is true with the lower number of repeats. The fewer repeats you have, uh, the uh, higher the expression uh, of the uh, androgen receptor. On sequencing, looking at the sequence of my genome, uh, I have the lowest number of repeats um, uh, thus far demonstrated. I had only three uh, CAG repeats. Uh, so I, am, I massively overexpress the androgen receptor. On having endocrine analysis, it turned out I had very low testosterone levels. But when you have massive amounts of receptors, it just takes a small amount of testosterone uh, to stimulate that. So even with low testosterone, I had a high testosterone phenotype. I was bald by age 21, uh, risk taker, uh, aggressive uh, personality. But because I had low testosterone levels, the endocrinologist put me on exogenous testosterone. Uh, which was the worst thing to do, but they weren't looking at receptor levels of the genome. So now I had tons of excess testosterone with uh, tons of excess receptors. Uh, and that's how my tumor developed very rapidly. I actually had two tumors. Uh, we grew the tumors in culture. They literally grew 10 times faster in the presence of testosterone. So that's a story of, of my own, of genotype, phenotype analysis. And it's indicative of what we could do with individuals of tracing back to the genome in many cases to find the genetic association with the disease. I'll show you several other pictures just to show the power of the, uh, uh, the restriction spectrum imaging. Uh, I paid to have all the scientists in my institute go through. Uh, this is an image from Ham Smith when he was 84. Uh, he had no symptoms. We found a massive uh, lymphoma growing in his chest uh, that uh, if we had not found it, the surgeon said he would have been dead in six weeks. Uh, he turns 93 in August, and so he's doing well. He has a cough from radiation damage from the treatment. But you can see a, a, a 10-year-old could do this diagnosis uh, because of the RSI imaging. Um, here's just a, a, another example, uh, a, a similar type of tumor. Here's a young woman uh, with a, a thyroid nodule. 
uh, again, they just, the tumors just light up very clearly. Uh, it was confirmed by a biopsy. Uh, with brain scans, uh, quite often we see uh, 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 brain tumors. Uh, this one may be a little bit harder to see. It's that uh, strawberry uh, type thing at the, at the top of the skull. Keep in mind, every one of these individuals are asymptomatic. They thought they were perfectly healthy. Uh, what we find in healthy people is a high-grade tumor in uh, everybody over, in 5% of everybody over 50. Uh, so fortunately, there's a lot of young people in the audience, but I say there's several here that are over 50. 5% uh, of you probably have a tumor that you are unaware of. Uh, the MRI also gives us amazing metabolic information. It's one of the few ways to measure organ fat. Uh, and it comes right off the MRI image. Uh, so we diagnose a large number of people with metabolic disease. Um, it turns out with organ fat, uh, we, we were, I was on a 30-mile bike ride with the world's expert on organ fat. And uh, we stopped for a break uh, halfway through. And he said, you know, doing all this exercise won't change your organ fat. Uh, only calorie restriction will. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me that 15 miles ago? But uh, um, it's very key because people that develop organ fat go on to develop NASH. Uh, quite often uh, need a, uh, a liver transplant. We can use the data from the MRI uh, to get very quantitative information of all your muscle mass uh, and your uh, peripheral and uh, visceral fat uh, as a measurement. Uh, and uh, it was really quite amazing in this group of asymptomatic healthy people uh, the fatty liver detection rate was 23 across all, 23% uh, across all age groups. We also do non-invasive cardiac testing with echocardiograms, coronary CTs, uh, and remote uh, monitoring. Uh, this is what the images look like. Uh, uh, you can see they're incredibly accurate where you can get very precise measurements of the heart uh, diagnose things, the valves show up very cleanly. This is all with a uh, non-invasive uh, uh, echocardiogram. Uh, with CT scan, we, we see uh, calcification plaques at around 12% of people, half of them under 60. Um, and uh, again, these are people that are asymptomatic. Getting back to Alzheimer's, uh, like I thought that I uh, was at risk for, uh, we've screened now a large number of APOE heterozygotes. Not one have we found Alzheimer's disease in. In contrast, we see uh, correlations of about 80% of homozygotes uh, with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but it's not 100%. Here's uh, um, this is the type of volumetric assays we get. Uh, if you can see the yellow areas, so that's the hippocampus. And so the main indication, you can see the uh, loss of the hippocampus uh, on the right. So it's, it's, it's fairly easy looking at the volumetric uh, from these uh, uh, non-contrast brain images. But here's a 73-year-old homozygote for APOE4 with a completely normal brain, no hint of Alzheimer's. So the genetic studies that are done are generally looking at very specific populations with disease. And then they over-extrapolate to, well, if the homozygote has the disease, heterozygotes must be at risk. The same information you know, too much extrapolation was done with BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, if you have genetic changes 
uh, in BRCA1 and BRCA2, you only have a 50% lifetime risk of breast or ovarian cancer unless you have a tremendous family history. If every woman in your family has breast or ovarian cancer, the risk goes up in the high 90%, which is what physicians were telling people just based on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 data, which was totally false. But it means that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are not the cause of breast and ovarian cancer. They're linked to it. And the family history shows that the genes that are actually causal are yet to be uh, discovered. Again, with uh, no contrast, the MRI images give us a, a complete view of your vascular tree. Uh, you used to have to have contrast to get these kind of images from the brain. And what we started seeing again in the healthy people, I don't know if you can see that little uh, bleb there at that loop, uh, that's an aneurysm. Uh, we find aneurysms in 1% of the population, but mostly in people under 50, which means genetic selection has already taken place. Uh, you rarely find aneurysms in people over 50 because they've already died from them. Aneurysms can be treated in 15 minutes as an outpatient, but generally uh, what happens is that people show up in the emergency room with a massive brain bleed uh, and die. So these individuals, again, are all asymptomatic. Uh, these are just straightforward assays with people with no apparent disease, they exercise, they're certain that they're the healthiest people on the planet. Um, physicians don't like doing these assays. And the reason for that is, um, in the 1970s, when CT scanning uh, really became popular, CT is just x-ray. Clinics were set up, uh, even storefront clinics. There were lots of whole body CT scans done. CT scans cannot distinguish between a tumor and a cyst. And so it meant that uh, further studies had to be done, usually a biopsy to see if it was a tumor or a cyst. Uh, insurance companies complained that it was increasing their cost. Uh, patients were put through all kinds of unnecessary procedures. So since the 70s, medical students were taught that it's basically unethical to do tests on asymptomatic patients. Uh, fortunately, the technology has changed. Uh, and now with this new type of uh, non-contrast MRI imaging with restriction spectrum imaging, uh, and you'll see adding AI on top of it, totally changes it so we don't have so-called incidentalomas anymore. The challenge is teaching the existing medical profession uh, about these changes. Uh, we had an extremely wealthy individual that we diagnosed as having a renal carcinoma. Uh, he went to Stanford University to get a second opinion. They did a standard MRI, told him he just had renal cysts and not to worry about it. Uh, we convinced him to see another radiologist at UC San Francisco who we knew understand the RSI imaging. Uh, he confirmed our diagnosis and uh, insisted he get a biopsy. Turns out he did have uh, a, a advanced renal carcinoma. And if he'd listened to standard medical care at Stanford, uh, he probably would not be alive today. So we stumbled on this. We were doing basic science that led us in totally a different direction. Uh, the United States has probably the highest health care cost in the world. Um, yeah, almost, uh, I think, uh, five to ten times what they are in Sweden and Norway and 
most other highly civilized countries. But in the US, and I think these numbers hold up pretty much across the board, one third of you that live to 50 will not live to age 75. And the key reasons are death from cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, uh, and then accidents uh, is the third leading cause uh, of death. Um, more than 75% of all the healthcare costs in US are due to uh, these few diseases, heart disease, cancer, stroke, metabolic disease. Uh, and these are also, as we've shown, are the most preventable uh, with early detection. So the, the effort is to try to uh, get the costliest 10% of the population, uh, which accounts for 63% of the cost, uh, early diagnosed. 1% um, of all the patients count for 20% of all the cost. And I'm sure that's true uh, regardless of the country. Uh, you just do it slightly more efficiently and the care costs less. Uh, people with three or more chronic diseases are in that 1% category and cost the most. Diabetes is the single biggest uh, cost as a chronic uh, disorder. Uh, but these things can be changed. Uh, I don't know if this is big enough that you can read it. Uh, this is the latest statistics um, on uh, deaths per year in the United States and the difference between the health span uh, and the lifespan. The ones in red are all the diseases that we detect with our non-invasive uh, eight hour, six to eight hour testing. Uh, and with early diagnosis and early treatment we convert these chronic diseases into acute treatable disease, and the cost goes down uh, very substantially. And we think we will narrow the gap between the health span uh, and the lifespan. Uh, this is longevity of all males, all races uh, in the United States. And you can see there's a, a huge disparity the South is uh, much less healthy. And then you see patches of uh, red around the country. Those are primarily Indian reservations, uh, where again, there's much uh, shorter longevity. Genetics helps. If you have two X chromosomes, uh, the world looks much better. Uh, but even in the South and in the Indian reservations, they still stand out as shorter longevity uh, than the, uh, the rest of the country. But there's tremendous socioeconomic and uh, ethnogeographic disparities. Uh, for example, American Indians, they, it's, uh, for males, the life expectancy is only 62 years. Uh, for the average for black Americans is 67 years, but in six cities like Washington, D.C., it's 55 years. So there's different pockets and different places. Um, so we have uh, proposals pending to create uh, mobile clinics, uh, mobile MRI and mobile cardiac clinics, uh, going to indigenous populations, uh, and to some of these areas uh, with tremendous health disparities uh, based on race and socioeconomic factors. Now, these tests are pretty inexpensive uh, to do. The biggest single cost is the cost of radiologists to read the uh, images. Because to do whole body MRI plus the brain scan uh, it takes four different radiologist specialists. Now, 
radiologists are getting scarce because they're afraid AEI is going to uh, replace them, which uh, we're trying to hasten that. Uh, so because there's fewer of them, the cost keeps going up for radiology reads. But we think that can be uh, the, the single biggest impact in uh, the cost of this preventative health care uh, is getting AI to read the MRIs. Now, with solid tumors, the restriction imaging, all of you can diagnose those just looking at it. You see the bright lights. With soft tissues, uh, breast and intestine, uh, it's much more difficult. Um, we're working with one of the world's experts on breast MRI imaging. Uh, we're trying to apply AI to this. and. Uh, the Venture Institute is going to open a new uh, clinic dealing with this, with um, uh, using uh, imaging uh, primarily uh, for improving women's health. Uh, but AI is absolutely essential to get away from mammograms. Mammograms, as you know, are just x-rays, so they have all the problems that the CT scan had. They can't distinguish between cysts and tumors. Uh, with this new technology, uh, we think uh, uh, we can get there. So it's, uh, it's like Lippmann's route. Uh, we started out in one area, started out to do an experiment uh, to improve the interpretation of the human genome. And uh, as I said, individual cases were doing this collectively and using AI to add the phenotype uh, to the genome, we think we're going to make a lot of progress in a short while on how each of our genomes codes for us uh, in our conditions. Uh, but I think this has a chance to be an exciting change for the future. Uh, my calculations are it could save the U.S. government $2 trillion a year uh, in health care expenses, but turning how medicine is practiced and paid for upside down uh, is probably the biggest challenge uh, we could ever face. But uh, thank you very much.